Everyone has a favorite brand that they remember as a child, a brand so tested by time that if you came across it today, it would evoke memories of your childhood. Well, we're about to explore one today, and best of all, it centers around food. Yeah. Let's get it, y'all. Louisiana. From its iconic cities to the swamps of Acadiana, its geography is just as diverse as the people that live there. To this day, family is at the core of who we are, and one of the things we'd love to do is share. As a rainy Cajun, I might be what you consider a Louisiana expat. Now living in the Seattle area, one of my missions in life has been to share my culture and introduce more people than ever to the place that I still call home. So grab your favorite beverage, find a spot to sit back and relax. The next episode begins now. All right, welcome Cajuns, connoisseurs, and couillons. You are tuned in to another fun and exciting episode of the Rainy Cajun Podcast. Side note, if you can actually see the sun, which we can't really do here right now, step outside for a second and get a glimpse of the eclipse that's going on like right now. Then get your tushy back inside. We got a show to do. All right, and speaking of a show, it is packed. So I'm going to get right to it. First and foremost, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Allison at Camellia Beans to talk about the 100-year anniversary of the company. <clears throat> its commitment to authenticity, a brand new product just hitting the store shelves is something she's going to share today. And I'll share that interview in a second. Then we'll have this week's trivia where you can win some amazing stuff from Camellia. And afterwards, Boudreaux joins us. There's Boudreaux for the BS News. All right, y'all, let's get this party started. Thanks for joining me today on the Rainy Cajun Podcast. Thank you for having me. You're launching a new product line. What are you guys launching? It's called Beans for Two. We have two products. We have the Red Beans for Two, the New Orleans style Red Beans for Two, and the Cajun style White Beans for Two. So it is basically a foolproof, very easy, yet authentic way to cook New Orleans style red beans and Cajun style white beans at home without purchasing all the ingredients. So the reason why it's called Beans for Two is it's actually designed for two people. We sell beans, mainly in a one one pound bag. Right. It feeds a family. There's a lot of people out there that don't know what to do with their leftovers or don't want to waste leftovers. They're empty nesters. They're younger, just got married. We this is the first product of its kind. There's other products out there like competitors that have a red bean and a seasoning, but this whole for two product is new. So we're really excited about it. Yeah. So how does it compare? to the competitors' products that have been out there? Just do this. Grab a competitor's red bean seasoning. I'm not going to say any names, but you can, you can grab one. Turn it over, look at the nutritional panel, and it's got your seasonings and all that stuff in it, but it has a lot of additives, things that you can't pronounce, like mono, glue, blah, blah, blah. Right. So... Our products are completely all natural, and we did that very intentionally because we're a 100-year-old bean company. As we expand our product lines and the seasonings, we want to still keep that all-natural approach. We spent a lot of time making sure that it tastes good and didn't have any of the extra stuff. So when you read our ingredients, it's red beans, salt. Red bell pepper, green bell pepper, garlic, smoked paprika, and some baker's yeast that helps. So the anti-caking sure. and onion. Also, the whole smaller portion size. Yeah. All, all of the other products out there are cook a family, which is great. And we do have some products like that. But we were looking for something innovative, new, fresh. And there's really dinner kits in general are designed for like family meals. Sure. So this is the same concept, except for you can cook it just for yourself or 
just for you and your spouse or mm-hmm. you and your kid or two kids. Yeah. yeah. Did our research and development chef that Chef Jamie that developed this product. She did all the tasting and we get the seasoning. We recently did a cooking show and what she did was she cooked the red beans for two, which is really easy. You literally just put it in a pot or put it in the Instapot yep. and let's set it and forget it. That's the, it's, we want it to be very simple and, and easy yet taste really good for a single person. And then, and then she cooked the leftovers for a second meal. So she did like wave of and chairs the next day. And then with the white beans, she did uh, a white bean chili. Again, that a lot of people don't want to deal with the leftover, a ton of leftovers. People feel bad to waste food, especially these days. Um, so that's basically the, the concept of the, the product. I like the, the idea of using the leftovers as a base for something that you're going to do later on, next day or whatever. Yeah, it just yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> The, I do have the white bean downstairs and the chili idea is like, oh, wow, I, I think my family might even be interested in eating something like that. Or you could just make it, use it with chili instead of buying all the seasoning and vegetables or whatever for the, right. for the chili, you just do that. So the bean possibilities are endless. So. Yeah. Um, as far as you, your focus at Camellia is beans has been, like you said, for a hundred years. And mm-hmm. what are the, some of the other bean products that you guys like selling, like marketing? Obviously being a New Orleans based company, red beans and rice is an iconic New Orleans dish. So people say the word camellia and they think red beans and rice, but we're, yeah, we're a bean company. Every culture, every region of America, uh, well, cause we primarily sell them in America and, and the Caribbean, have some sort of cultural dish. And sure. it's not it's not about red beans in, in the Carolinas. It's all about pinto beans and lima beans. So we sell those. And you want me to name them all? No. I <laughs> so, yeah, we want baby people lima, to green website. baby lima. <laughs> <laughs> that's sponsors. actually, that's a really cool thing about the website is that it does educate you. It's not just about the products. It does give you a little bit of history. And also, obviously, there's the recipes. There's all of the ideas for how this particular bean might be used. And here's some things to try. And if there is historical information, you provide that there. And I actually learned quite a bit. I didn't realize there was so much information about beans, but of course there is. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of years of usage of beans in different dishes, Cajun, Creole, and beyond. So our our website is, it's not like sales focused. It it was designed to be informational. We consider ourselves, I mean, we've been a bean company for a hundred years. So we consider ourselves to be the bean authority. And we don't want to, we don't want to hold in that knowledge. Yeah. We have some proprietary things that we we do, of course, but as far as just information about beans and recipes and all that good stuff, people recipes people will send them in and we post them you're from louisiana so you get how the people down here are all about coming together and helping each other out and really we wouldn't be we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the the community um so we do a lot of sharing of other people's recipes and highlighting restaurants so it's not about us but but yeah we do have the uh, the beanopedia is what you're referring to. It, it's, I even learned some stuff like about the origin of certain beans yeah. and stuff like that. I know I'm nerding out right now, but, but yeah, oh, if your favorite bean, if your favorite bean is like lentils and you don't really know much about it, you just love lentils and it's cool to know the origin and all that. And then you can click on it and there's like a hundred lentil recipes. They're so versatile that if Armageddon hits, we all need to have our stockpile of beans. That's that's certainly something that I think you can go down the rabbit hole of learning about beans. And it's it really, it all hits home when you actually try the product, right? And that's, you can read until you're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, you're, you know, you, you want to taste the, the final product and and yeah, the, the different so, recipes that you guys have allow you to try it in so many different forms. Yeah, which is great. Once it 
one tip, I'm sure it's on the website somewhere. I, I feel like I come up with like secret tips and then because what people will comment and will post about it or whatever. Again, yeah. there's, no, there's no secrets. But one thing that I learned was uh, was pre-cooking beans, let's say garban garbanzo beans that you make hummus out of. But you can also put them in salads. Right. So you cook a pound of garbanzos and stick them in individual little containers and freeze them. And then you can just grab one out. And then it's pre-cooked. Oh, people will be like, oh, I, I use canned because it's so easy. Yes, it is. But if you're eating natural and that, that's important to you, then it's really not. Some people are scared of beans because it can be complicated. Oh, I have to watch them on a stove all day long. And right. it doesn't have to be that way. So sometimes it takes a little bit of meal prepping, but so does like making your kids lunches for the week. Well, yeah, 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 I mean, really anything worth making is going to take a little bit of time, whether it's, yeah, uh, <clears throat> you know, I did uh, roast beef po' boys the other day. And that's a, that, roast beef is, it's a bit of a, to cook it right it, and to get that flavor that I'm used to, whether it's at Bears or Parkway or something like that. I see no, your eyes I'm go wild. I was waiting to see if you were like the shredded, Pool boy, guy. what kind of roast beef pool boy guy are you? And now I know. Yeah, well, my first we're, stop. We're the I, same. We're the same roast beef. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, if it's like, like flappy chunks, it's uh, but the <laughs> when I land at the airport, I take airline way over to Transcontinental, and there's short stop po' boys right there, and that's my first stop. And I just had bears about two years ago on the one in Covington. And I was blown away. I want to keep moving along here. But so we, in the past, when you and I first started talking, one of the things that we talked about was authenticity. And the things that you can buy that are branded Louisiana or Cajun or whatever, often are not, or they're a very poor approximation or they're using artificial ingredients to get whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. So for you and for Camellia, what is your, what does authenticity mean to you? So yes, with the newer products and the seasoning line, I've talked about that, like using all natural ingredients, even if it costs a little bit more, we're not going to cut any corners. And that, that whole, what I just said, cutting corners, like that, that goes back to like the essence and core of our hundred year old history. People can argue beans are beans right? and sure. In a way, they are, but our beans are, first of all, we only accept above grade number one. It's literally deemed the Hayward standard in the bean industry. Like our farmers that we work with know, even before they send us a sample with the new crop, like that, that's not going to cut it. We only accept the top. And the, the consistency of that over decades is what has is what people rely on that. What their grandmother cooked and what their mom cooked and what they're cooking, they want it to be the same. So that's part of cooking on an authentic dish, whether it's not whether it's New Orleans or a Hispanic dish or another Southern dish, you, you want to have the right high quality ingredients. So like our our beans are like the freshest crop. We only use the highest quality. We've been working with the same farmers for decades so there's like a relationship piece there yep uh all of our beans are farmed in the usa whenever we get like a shipment in we go through quality checks we will return fifty thousand pounds of beans a, a truckload if it's not up to standard it's not fun when that happens but we're not gonna we're not gonna take it just because it drove here for three days so that's part of the some of the authenticity piece and then when you're talking about dishes like red beans and rice you want to have the andouille sausage you want to have the certain type of rice yep. you want to have camellia beans and they cook faster they're creamier it is a dried bean is comes out the ground so you do have to sort them even though we clean them and that that's that's part of everything that we do and have always done what? it's like embedded into the culture of the company from myself from my brother who's our ceo to our a new warehouse person that's been there a week. He knows. Drilling down on that just a little bit, with this being the hundred year anniversary of the company, you t you touched on it just now. But what do you think has really contributed to the longevity of Camellia over the years, given 
increased competition given all the things that foods fall in and out of favor. It just depends. What, do you, what in your mind, as you're part of the family, you've seen it all, I'm sure. And so what do you think, what is it about the people that work at the company or the, the products or what, I mean, what, what is it that has contributed to the company being around for so long in your mind? Yeah. It's that unwavering commitment to, to high quality in everything that we do. We pay homage to our community because without our community, we wouldn't be here today. If people weren't buying beans generation over generation or weren't loyal to the brand. And look, that happens a lot. People, sure. especially nowadays, people just, you know, they may have grown up on I'm trying to think of a brand that ain't there no more. And it could have been a great brand, but like over time, people just go and grab the newest, hottest, coolest looking packaging or the the cheapest, the sure. store brand or whatever. And we see that. We see those ebbs and flows. Right now, people are very price conscientious. Sure. The economy that's happening. But one of the, I guess I'll tell you, one of, one of the things that separates us, and this is something my grandfather, so I'm a fourth generation and I, we have my nephew uh, working so with us now. So he's it's actually five generations. Wow. Um, he actually does the, the website, the e-commerce. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. We were talking about him. Yeah. He's on, he's on the back of the box. If you want to see our faces, it's just embarrassing. But, uh, on the back <laughs> of the, the beans for oh, two? The, the, yeah, the beans for two box has our little rendering. And I was like, oh, do I look like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I guess so I'm guessing he's a young one there. Yeah. Okay. So, So that's... Gen generation three, four, and five right there. So we started in the French market, you know, before grocery stores were even a thing. We'll go down to whatever market and would scoop the beans out and put them in their own sack. There wasn't packaging. And then in the 40s and the 50s, when brick and mortar grocery stores started happening, that's when we started packaging, which was my grandfather. And there was, they were packaging rice and other beans. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, I don't know if you'll see rice and, and beans are in the pillow packs yeah, that are like this. And they're like, they're, you can't see through them usually. Or maybe you see like a little window, right. but you can't really see the product. So my grandfather sourced this, the cellophane package because he wanted this to be at the grocery store and to, to, for you to see that all these beans are perfect beans. There's no splits. There's no, no discoloration. Right. So that's, we don't, we can't hide anything. <laughs> we literally can't, right? This, this is a plastic bag, but this cellophane keeps the beans fresher longer mm. than some of the other packaging, the plastic filler packs, yep. which are another very strategic, I don't care if it costs five cents more or whatever it did. It probably was like a penny back then, which is like $5 now. But anyways, I don't care. Within reason, I don't care if things cost more. We're not going to cut corners. So that's in my office. I'll have to, I'll take a picture and show you. I have a cellophane. It's first because it's literally a bag of beans from like the 70s. But it can't be any worse so, than a McDonald's so, fry from the 50s. It, it looks, it looks funny. And the, the packaging is different. We've updated it, but it's still, you I'll send you a picture. You'll see it and you're like, oh, that's a bag of chameleon beans. Yeah. So yeah. Looking forward. And I know the, the future is always uncertain. You have goals as a company and you have your own personal goals. And obviously being a family run business, everything has to be in alignment. It'd be nice for both of us to be sitting here today saying, we'll see what the next hundred years look like. Likelihood of me being around till I'm 150, probably not that good. But, but if you had to look into a crystal ball and kind of look at the near term and the long term future, I know this has probably been discussed at some level. Where do you see the company going? Where, what kinds of things do you see you guys looking into or without revealing yeah. anything? If you're working on new stuff, little hints or nuggets there, it just, what do you think is the, that immediate and that long-term future going to look like for Camellia? 
I think we'll, we'll always be a bean company, even though we, last year we came out with a jambalaya mix and a dirty rice mix. As we expand on products, it'll be Louisiana based. Yeah, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to turn around and go start making ice cream or something. I never say never, who knows? <laughs> I mean, I, I love ice cream. My brother found a deal on an ice cream company. He'd probably buy it, probably just <laughs> internally eat it. Anyways, we're, we're always going to be pay homage to our Louisiana roots, you know, yeah. that authentic, natural, healthy, delicious tasting company. So we'll always have our beans. In this day and age, being a company that can analyze trends and data, everything's at our fingertips and that's the, like the technology, that's how the world is. So we're taking that to make decisions based on not leaving who we are as a company, but decisions that are like innovative and what the future wants and needs. The world changed like crazy the past three years. So true. Matt, really the past, I don't know, 15 years. Can you imagine the next 15 years? So staying relevant. Right. That's a lot of brands and not just food brands. That's another thing about the, the beans for two, like. How do we capture that younger generation that is their, everything's at their fingertips. They can just order red beans and rice through DoorDash and it's there in five minutes. And I think there's a lot of that generation that's very like health conscious and our products fall in line to that. So we, we are luckily, we as just the world and humans know more about what a balanced diet looks like. You need your protein, but you also, it's okay to eat some carbohydrates. So they're a superfood, literally. So, so yeah, we're, we're lucky to, to have that to keep us, to, to be that type of product to where we're, we're always going to, someone's always going to need us. But if we, if we don't work very hard to innovative, staying true to our roots, not cutting corners, and just understanding the customer, Mm -hmm. which is changing. I think about that. I think about how much my grandmother cooked and my mom learned from her because yeah. my, my grandmother was a homemaker. Right. And then my mom cooked a lot too. She was a teacher, so she did have that balance with raising two crazy girls. Um, <laughs> and then there's me, full-time job. I'm like, I do try my best to cook with my, he's seven, so we, we yeah. do a little bit. But like, I have to be very conscious about it. I can very easily just be like multitask okay you get in the bathtub while i cook dinner because we only have two hours to do this as a society it's just different so to just stop take pause and do those things or, or it is quick like the instapot and the air fryer mm -hmm. i mean as a working mom have changed my life so to, the fact that you can cook beans in the instapot it's a game changer sure. and yeah so it it doesn't have to be the same, but you can still cook that same dish that yeah. my grandmother, that I, my grandmother taught me, or I wash her do it. I feel like it never tastes the same, but. But that's, I, I, and I think about that too, the nostalgia of New Orleans. And then I, for instance, as I, I left in my early twenties and I haven't really been back, but all my family's still there, mostly on the North shore after Katrina. And it always feels like when I go back home, the food is a lot better than what I can even make here. And I try and be, I ship up the Leidenheimer bread. I'm, I'm deadly serious about every little thing that comes out of my kitchen being as true to the original recipe that I remember. And I still, there's, somebody's not telling us something. But the, and that's a thing that I think is going to be the biggest challenge for you guys, and actually anybody who has created traditional dishes, is that you've got these Gen Zers that maybe had parents like yourself, working parents that did a lot of dining out or did a lot of quick cooking, and so they've not been exposed to the all day long cook of whatever it is they, because it takes time and their parents didn't have the time. Keeping that momentum going and like you said, staying relevant is going to be a bit of a challenge because of the fact that they don't necessarily know what it should taste like. And then what are the merits of what is red beans and rice? Beans and rice, and there's a bunch of natural ingredients in there to go along with it. And now 
for them, fusion is all where things are and making things just over the top. And yeah. so, yeah, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a challenge, but through the education that you guys have been doing on your website and coming out with new products, that keeps you at the forefront. Yeah. And that, you know, that whole, the whole fusion thing is a to is totally a thing. And don't yeah. get me wrong, I, I love it. I love it too. I did, I recently read an article about, and it actually highlighted red beans and rice, but it was other dishes, the regional, historical, it wasn't just about New Orleans. And like we talked about authenticity a lot Yep. and are going above and beyond to go to seek that out. So yeah. hopefully maybe we all can't like cook it at home, but like the more that stays as part of our society and grows, then yeah, we'll still be in business. But. Well, I mean, you look <laughs> at like, like Dookie's for instance, and you know, as she passed her recipes down to uh, Dookie, but they yeah. call them Duke, yeah. There is hope because those there's people like that, those generational folks that they did take up the mantle. So rather than being your traditional in the workforce type of young person, it's going to be a treat. And then you're to go out to one of these restaurants that is actually doing it the old fashioned way. And people are inevitably going to want to make this at home with the Beans for Two products. You've got a way for people to do that and not have the hassle of of having to deal with the time involved. And I think that's cool. Hopefully that there's a there's enough of a a continuum of generational chefs that keep the original recipes alive so that it continues to remind people of what our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents used to make and, and we used to eat. So fingers crossed that this all works out. The last couple of times I've cooked red beans, I've, I have a bunch of samples at my house, but I, it, I love it. I'm not just, I could just be saying that. No one would know. <laughs> but then, I really, I, I cook it at home. I've eaten a lot of the product as we sampled it. And we're like developing it. Sure. But like, I'm, I have opted to just be like, let me just cook this instead of, it doesn't even take, especially here you can buy the Trinity already pre-chopped and the mix is, an, it's a good mix. Like, you know, I, the, I don't have to do anything else. Anyways, I haven't even been doing that. I've just been like, it tastes good. I like it. Yeah. And I'm a bean snob. Liz, okay. I can cook red beans and rice, like homemade. I but... might have to take you up on that when I eventually do get back down there. I'm like, I, I, I look forward to being able to see the facility and talk to you guys in the future. Yeah, come by. We'll yeah. give you a bean tour. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I've never been on a bean tour. <laughs> I can honestly say in my 50 years of life, I've never been on a bean tour. We don't give them out to the public. So it's okay. a special thing. Ooh, but... that, that makes me feel good. Yeah. The, as a lot of the followers of this podcast know, uh, being up in Seattle, we really have one spot where we can get Camellia products reliably. And that's the Alpha's Louisiana and Spices, which is in Kent, a suburb of Seattle. And they just signed on with a major grocer distributor down in Louisiana, and that's one of the distributors you guys go through. Now, obviously, if people want to try these products out, they can go to your website and purchase them via your and website. Amazon. All right. Amazon and the website, yeah. Okay. And then for people back home where you are. And Walmart, like we do walmart.com. Okay, but you're in like Rouse's and Winn-Dixie mm -hmm. and all those, the local stores there? Yeah. The, okay. We're in all those, but the, the new products, if they're not in those stores right now, they will be. We have orders okay. coming. Yeah. Walmart, Winn-Dixie, Rouse's, all of the independent like Lang and & Fines and Fresh Market, you know, or Robert's. Like, and then beans for two going all the way up to through Florida and then to the Carolinas at some other chain there, the Publix, when Food Lion. So, yeah. So it's pretty yeah. widespread at this point, the beans. For yeah. Two. People, the buyers for these grocery stores are excited about it because it's, it's something different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Ali, thank you so much. This was this is great information, and I want to thank you for your time. For those of you who are watching the podcast live, I'm going to have a little tidbit for you at the end that might score you some beans, like maybe a lot of beans. Watch till the <laughs> end to make sure to catch that. But again, thank you very much for being part of the Rainy Cajun podcast. It was really cool to talk to you guys, and it's great to put faces to a brand that I've known my entire life. And, and I really hope that things just continue to evolve and you guys reach more and more people with your product. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. You know, there's something that happens when you talk with people back home, whether it's uh, people that you've never known before and you grew up at the same time. And then the next thing you know, uh, you're you're connecting with them in your adult life, your later adult life, and uh, I mean, of course, I've known Camellia my entire life. They 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 their beans are you know synonymous uh, with New Orleans cooking, and uh, I've already personally tried the beans for two uh, product, and I was really happy with the results. Now, <clears throat> uh, my cousin David, out of Mobile. Uh, he also had tried his hand at both products, and I can't wait to talk to him about his experience and share it with y'all. So let's see if this one works this time. There we are. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was going to kind of joke around and say that this was a completely unexpected surprise, but I would say the mere fact of getting you on the show has been an unexpected surprise <laughs> because uh, this has been, uh, well, th let's just say that, uh, you know, like I said, post-editing is going to be our friend for this particular show. Um, so David... Uh, is a cousin of mine. He's on my side of the family, the Cajun side of the family. Um, you know, he's kind of become the the personality in the Gulf South, uh, known for the Meloton. And if you don't know what a Meloton is, um, he's got a YouTube channel. I'll point you to um, in a bit. Um, but that aside, um, how's it down there, in Mobile, right now? Wow, <clears throat> it's not too bad. Uh yeah. I think we're in the six uh, upper or mid seventies still, probably a lot warmer than where you're at. Um, but it's yeah. cool for us, based on the last couple of weeks. Um, we got up to the nineties and didn't get rain for I don't know three weeks or so. So it was uh, it was the dry Cajun over here. <laughs> so um, I I just actually just watched your video this morning. For, I guess it was from last weekend. You had. Uh, uh, kind of giving people a rundown of the state of your garden. And um, so not to get too deep into the weeds on this one, because I'm sure we're going to have plenty of opportunities to talk, but um, w w how was the growing season this year? Well, yeah, melitons um, are more of a, they grow all year long, but mm -hmm. they are a uh, fall producing crop. And okay. so everybody through South Louisiana and South Alabama have really had a struggle because of the heat dome. Um, they'll start to come out of the ground around April uh, yep. and really thrive. And then you don't get the fruit until Thanksgiving time. That's why you see it on the uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas tables in New Orleans. Gotcha. Um, so everybody's been struggling. A lot of people lost plants. Uh, we got about 2000 or so folks who follow on our Facebook group, as well as um, a website that uh, Dr. Lance Hill from Tulane created. And now is the time we expect to see flowers. And unfortunately, uh, the flowers are about a month behind for me. Although some people who have uh, grown some of the ones that I have are doing well with them. So uh, I'm kind of saying the yields are going to be low this year. Yeah. Yeah, well, you guys did have uh, uh, an exceptionally hot summer, uh, even for the South, and mm -hmm. but I, but I think it went longer than usual. Like, I mean, I my memory escapes me, but I remember starting school. You know, we get a you know, you know in the South we start school in the and usually mid to late August, and uh, I remember the first week to first three weeks or so being 
kind of normal temperature wise, like it's summertime temperatures. And then all of a sudden you yeah. could get that Christmas in the air. And then by the time end of September, early October rolled around, it was, uh, it had cooled down significantly. So, right. um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just unfortunate, but well, I mean, you're that, just gonna have to pick your battles, week's... right? Yeah. That's what this week actually is starting to feel like a little bit more of that normal fall yeah. time that we're used to. So, um, I'm hoping that that's, you know, the good thing too, is that the season grow, uh, goes a, quite a while. Right. Um, and so actually until the first frost comes across, uh, we're pretty good. I don't know if my AC is messing me up, but it just kicked on. So don't worry about it, man. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I could use a little AC. Well, actually all I got to do is open the window right now, but, uh, I get yeah. everything else that goes with it. I have a little diatribe on that at the end of this, uh, the show today um so you know this this past week was national gumbo day seems like there's a national day for everything but i'll save that for another discussion because i hear it Mm -hmm. every time i bring my daughter and and, uh, wife to school and work um the local radio station says it's national yada day and and i'm going really there's a day for that and it just sounds like you know it's just marketing right but uh they time National Gumbo Day with roughly the time that a lot of people would be start to be making gumbo because of the, the changing of the weather. Um, but you bucked the trend this weekend, and you made some beans. How did it go? That's right. Uh, it went very well. Um, they uh, made two beans, white beans and red beans. It's some of the best batch of beans I've uh, made in a while so um more to come i guess we'll talk about that i don't know if you want to talk about it now or later but um i uh i guess you let the secret out yeah that's the secret to the uh, to making good beans and actually uh the camellia brand has been i was thinking back earlier you know because i grew up uh outside of louisiana my parents moved away uh, when i was in texas and um i was thinking that the brands that we had from Louisiana back in the early 70s uh, were very few and far between. And one of them was always Camellia. We had Camellia red beans and uh, French market coffee and Tabasco. Yeah. And, and you know, would you, would you have uh, in, in this product, this new Camellia product, is a way to kind of shorten that process but also have – um, a much more focused, uh, like a like a meal, you know. It mm-hmm. beans for two. I mean, I, I'll be the first one to admit it. I ate the whole damn thing, um, but you know that's me. Uh, I, I think in that's most, yeah, no- <laughs> you did too. <laughs> yeah. David and I were talking last night. He made hamburgers for the girls, and he ate the beans, and uh, I ended up doing hamburgers as well. But anyway. Um, so, so you, I mean, your experience, so as far as like the, you know, the flavors and, and whatnot, how, how did that, how did that turn out for you? I think the flavors were pretty spot on. Now, I think some people, uh, you know, they, as you've mentioned before, a lot of people will equate uh, Louisiana food with hot right. and spicy. And I don't find that at all here. I find it flavorful. It's well balanced. Um, you've got um, a mixture of different uh, traditional Louisiana spices that go into it. So, you know, if you think it, it still allows you to add, if you want to add your favorite hot sauce to it, you can do that, but you don't need to add anything else. Now, for my palate, I found it maybe just the beans by themselves, maybe a little on the salty side, but. If you put that on a bed of rice, like traditionally is served, it balances out. So I think that, you know, the one thing I would say is, you know, I use some good double D sausage in it and it was supposed to be hot and I didn't actually find it hot. So just choose your, if you're using a meat with it, uh, an accompanying ham or, or something like that, you know, choose something that's probably not going to over be overly, uh, interfere with the, the flavors that are already there. Just mm-hmm. something that's kind of maybe adds some smokiness to it. But um, 
I think that once you get that on a bed of rice, everything balances out really well. And then especially if, depends on what your traditions are. If you like maybe cornbread on the side or right. just uh, French bread, I think that that it, it balances out well. We've made red beans and rice when we had the restaurant. We did it, and we did it the old-fashioned way, and it took all day. And, you know, get that, that texture right, that creaminess right. And they they figured out a way to to condense that down and make it even easier to to right. make the products. And um, as Allison mentioned in her interview with me, they focused very heavily on authentic ingredients, real ingredients, not a lot of chemicals, um, actually no chemicals. Um, so, you know, it, it really, it you know, it comes down to th- that's their philosophy, right? And they want to make... Right. They want to make a product that um, is reminiscent of what you remember growing up as a kid, but without having to chop the vegetables and, you know, basically get everything going. But I noticed in your video, you still did go through the process of, you know, slicing that sausage nice and thin and then browning it and then taking it off Mm -hmm. to the side now the one thing i didn't see did you use that as a did you use the the oils at all as a base for Mm -hmm. the no you didn't okay so you just i I followed the instructions on the box uh exactly yep um and just like you pointed out uh to get that bean um tenderness it usually takes several hours and uh, I think it's an hour and a half is what the box is. Ten, boil it 10 minutes, right. an hour and a half to actually cook it with everything in it. Right. And uh, or simmer it for an hour and a half with a cover on it. And then uh, I think I had probably, because of trying to video it and all, I probably lost my simmer for a bit. So it probably really needed to go about an hour and 40 for me. Mm-hmm. But uh, I found it tender. And um, that's one of the things that... Um, the white beans were very white. I mean, I saw somebody on one of the social media pages posting their white beans, and, and they looked a little orange. Uh, <laughs> but these white beans from Camellia, uh, and, and some of our cousins up in the uh, uh, River Parish, uh, they pride themselves on how white their beans can be. And so um, that was one of the things that stood out to me, how yeah. uh, white it looked. And so, uh, you know, I, I would probably, if I was going to do a little more um, – Old school, I'd probably throw in maybe some pickled pork if you could do that as opposed to sausage. Um, and then uh, the red beans, uh, like I said, everything within you know plus or minus 10 minutes of that timing, right? I thought it came out perfect. So I, I commend them. They got they got a really good, I mean, it's a good way to learn how to make red beans that can be your base, or you can, um, you know, if you're off, your kids are off to college. I mean, right. I'd be eating that instead of ramen noodles. Oh hell yeah! I mean, just, uh, why? Why would you? I mean, well, I you know I have uh, all my kids are half Japanese, so they'll probably go for the ramen first. But I'm trying. I try. <laughs> you know, it's like I've got I got four kids, and I told them I said, you know, you you're uh, you're part Cajun, and they're like, yeah. Especially my daughter, she's too cool, right? You know, I, you got to, and and you know, it's like, yeah. they, you know, once they get a certain age, they they develop a little bit of an attitude, and I'm like, no, you got to understand that this is your heritage, and um, you should appreciate these foods. But I, you know, truth be told, I didn't really appreciate a lot of these foods until I got older, anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just, uh, you know, I I did that uh, that sandwich yesterday, the the Poke Muff, and uh, and that's my name. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> um, and uh, and I thought I remember a time where I used to think that the the idea of a muffaletto was disgusting, and now I could I could eat it. I mean, I shouldn't, but I could eat it almost every day. Yeah. You know, especially the way th- those turned out, and it wasn't that hard wasn't that far. All right, cool. Well, um, I appreciate you calling in. Uh, if you want to stick around for the rest of the show, that's, that's totally cool. Uh, I'm going to get on with some trivia here and, um, yeah, we got, we got a hundred dollar gift card to give away from Camellia for, uh, for that person who gets the questions right. So let me switch over here. 
and we're going to go over and let's see here. Okay. So you guys know we got it, the clue dat, right? And this is our beans. I don't need those beans on anymore. Let's see if I can turn those off. And there we go. Technical fun today. All right. So this is going to be centered around the interview that I did with Allison. So if you were paying attention, great. If you weren't paying attention, um, that's okay too, because I'll probably hack the video together because it looks like it's going to need a little bit of work anyway. Okay. So let us go with clue, clue number one. Now, how old is the Camellia brand? This should be easy. This is a softball. This is intended to get you thinking and maybe gone. Okay, this is this is the easy question, all right? It's going to get a little bit tougher from here. All right, clue number two. What is the name of the new product? Well, it's been certainly said enough times on this podcast so far that you should have it down. And if you don't, you need to go back and watch the video. All right. And the initial release of the Beans for Two product has two variations. What are the two variations? And then finally, what spices are used in the new product? Now, David and I were just talking about this, but um, hopefully you caught it in the interview as well. And if you didn't, again, Go back and watch it because it's all in there and we're not talking about the competitors we're talking about uh the uh the the uh, chameleon brand product all right so now let me uh, turn that off go back here <laughs> it's all these switches now all right so, um, so we're going to move on here with the trivia and, uh, we're going to go on to, let's see here. I believe we have, uh, oh, one, one quick thing. The, if you need to do the, uh, if you didn't copy this down before, um, let me see if I can go. Okay, it's cluedat at rainycajun.com. For some reason, that's not coming up here. Oh, maybe because I need to do this. There we go. Cluedat at rainycajun.com. That'll get you a direct line email. First person that answers wins the $100, answers correctly, wins the $100 gift card. And uh, I'll get you in contact with Camellia, and they'll send it over to you. And it's good for anything on their store, which is pretty cool, uh, including merchandise. You don't need to get beans, although you probably should probably should okay now let's go back here and um again i want to give a huge shout out to to david uh he didn't have to uh act as my you know technical test for the interview but uh <laughs> it was fun it was fun and i'm gonna have to go back and figure out what we did and what we did uh incorrectly or what i did incorrectly all right so it's time for the bs news all right and of course we have with us Woodrow. there he is and um so first things first um and this is you know i try and remain apolitical on this show but um um Representative Scalise dropped out of the speaker bid uh, on Thursday night. And, it, you know, of course, it would have been nice to have a Louisianian sitting on the highest, uh, one of the highest seats in the land. Uh, but, you know, them's the breaks. And, and quite honestly, when I was reviewing why he bowed out, I don't blame the guy at all. Um, man, politics has gotten nasty, even within the party. And... I mean, I don't know about you, but when I uh, when I went politics free in my life, my my stress levels just dropped immensely, and uh, you know, I just seeing what what Scalise had to go through, I was like, nope, not returning to that fifth pit of hell. So, um, also, the Sugar Bowl CEO was in town. 
Um, he was pitching to business leaders and local uh, leaders uh, regarding funding for the Sugar Bowl. Now, apparently, it is uh, competing against the likes of Nashville and Vegas for college football playoffs. And, um, of course, New Orleans has been in the rotation for some time now. And um, it's always been a destination for football, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on. But, you know, Vegas is stacked with money, and, of course, Nashville wants to justify their existence. So uh, the the CEO and the Sugar Bowl Committee have their work cut out for them, for sure. Um, and uh, they have to have something figured out by spring, at least according to the CEO. So... Uh, basically I think he was coming to town saying, please give me money. I need money. Um, now something else that I thought was kind of interesting. We have not one, but two golfing centers coming to New Orleans, top golf right on the river. Uh, it's right by the convention center and, and <clears throat> one called 504 F O R E in a spot, uh, just off, off of broad, a uh, little bit further north, not too far from the Superdome. Um, they both seem to be well-funded. <sighs> there is the issue of crime. So um, will will there be enough people coming into town to play golf in this kind of social setting? They're really cool. Um, you got an upper deck, lower deck, tons of things to do. It's kind of like a, um, you know, a modern take bowling alley you know, stall the stall service and a little game center and everything like that. Lots of corporate events, lots of corporate events. Um, also, something else, uh, for those of you from New Orleans or currently residing in New Orleans, you know you take, when you're going to the Audubon Zoo, you're taking the River Road and you're kind of going right before you cross over the tracks and you're at the zoo, there's this kind of ratty old, you know, corrugated metal facility there and turns turns out that two norlinians uh purchased that property they're saying for five million dollars which sounds kind of low to me but um i guess the plan is to develop that area and so right along the river there you're going to have uh complexes which really do appear to be um kind of laying the groundwork for like a mixed use so Condos, townhomes, whatever they in apartments, you know, that seems to be the longer term version. Okay, so <clears throat> LSU starts playing here pretty soon. Uh, now, of course, they won uh, by 10 points last weekend. Uh, they are now ranked 22nd overall and are currently an 11 point favorite over uh, Auburn today. Um, so, who you got? David, I'm going to bring you in here real quick because I, I kind of want your take here. But um, what do you think about LSU? <laughs> <laughs> I know I kind of sprung this on you at the last minute. I did, we didn't talk about That's doing okay. this ahead of time. But, you know, what do you uh, think? Well, I, I mean, I guess can you uh, – to me, I guess the high water mark still, at least from a football standpoint, was – uh, back when they, uh, they won recently with uh, Joe Burrow and and uh, Coach uh, O, um, yep. I've I've still go back and forth with the current coach a little bit. I'm not quite sure, uh, but I do like uh, the quarterback Daniels. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's after so long before we got Joe Burrow. I think we had, I mean, it was a vast. Uh, I mean, we had some good ones, but we also had a lot of them that just weren't as good as. Uh, you know, living here in Mobile, I get a lot of Alabama yeah. Tide stuff going, uh, so I got to yeah. live with that. Um, yeah, sorry but, about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> we'll have our battles. But uh, <laughs> the, anyway, but uh, I don't know. I, I kind of get, to me, it seems like they always uh, start off either real strong or or they, they start coming on a little later. I mean, I was glad to see last week that they pulled it out. It was mm -hmm. really about halftime. I thought about just shutting it down and going and doing some stuff out in the yard. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad I hung on. Uh, but, uh, you know, 
I don't know. It's kind of mixed. I mean, because like I always tell everybody at work that, uh, you know, once Saban is gone, you know, even when Coach O and, and Les were there, you know, LSU always had pretty good teams. And yeah. Not that they, you know, and they were exciting and are still fairly exciting to watch. It's just that, you know, if everybody's holding them up to that uh, saving level, you know, it's, there's only going to be one person at the top. And, yeah. um, and so I guess I, I kind of, uh, I don't know if everybody's trying from the, from the school standpoint and all, if they're trying to emulate that kind of legacy or not. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm hoping I hope that they do as well as they're supposed to against Auburn today. Uh, Auburn has its own struggles as well from year to year. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. I, like I said, I'm, I'm still a little, uh, I'm not as overwhelmed, I guess, as I was a couple, uh, a couple of years ago. So I'm, yeah. I'm hoping for the best and ho- hopefully my mind will change and uh, I'll root for them no matter what. But, uh, <laughs> well, that's I my mean, take on it. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so then the flip side is, and I'm glad I have some, uh, some back and forth here that I d- actually did not plan, but um, on the flip side, you have the Saints, right? Yeah. So, uh, had you gone outside and done yard work two weeks ago when they were playing the Packers, you would have come in and been stunned by the result, right? Um, last week, I don't, I mean, look, Belichick has had an amazing run as a coach. And it's clear that uh, he's he's in his twilight years as a, as a head coach, and and he he just looked relatively emotionless on the sideline last weekend. I mean, he was getting clobbered, and he knew it um, by a team that was not really expected to do much this year. And yeah, it's one thing to lose, but to lose in a shutout at home is pretty rough for any coach to take um houston on the other hand seems to be kind of on the upswing and um they are about a one and a half point favorite for tomorrow's game uh what what do you think what what's your take on i mean first of all the saints overall uh situation and then you know what these teams that we've got coming up, I think the Falcons are coming up at some point. The Dirty Birds will be on, um, but we've got the Texans to get through, and they don't look so lowly like the Pats did. So, yeah. what do you think? Do you I, think it's going to be? I think it's going to be followed, easier week, harder week? What? I, th- I think from what you're describing, it's probably going to be a little bit harder. Um, I hadn't followed the Saints as much as I do LSU. Um, mm-hmm. I think the last several years with <laughs> having to attend high school football games on Friday nights and then <laughs> LSU on, on Saturday by Sunday, if I've got any time left. Um, right. But I, I mean, uh, I always want them to do well. Um, and uh, I'll listen sometimes to the uh, WWL on the way home, listening to the uh, what, uh, Bobby talks about and, uh, some of that, but I hadn't really uh, followed them as much this year. So other than what you've been telling me, so I'll have to tune in tomorrow because I think uh, it sounds like it could be a very interesting game, uh, especially since my, uh, all my friends back in uh, Houston uh, be an interesting thing to kind of go back and forth with. Yeah, you're kind of sandwiched, you know, both college-wise. I mean, not not geographically speaking, but in terms of ranking, team ranking, football interest levels. Um, you know, the Texans have been n- not not anything to really write home about, but – uh, mm-hmm. with the Saints having their struggles, you know, I, I just, uh, everybody's like, oh, the Saints are back. They're, everything's back to normal. It's like, ah, guys, they played the Pats. I mean, you know, professional football is just professional p- football, and I don't want to yeah. take away from the fact that Kamara and Thomas both st- stood up last week and kind of took leadership of the team because it, there was – no real effective uh, leadership from uh, their their teammates, and maybe that lit a fire. I I am I'm not really sure. I don't I'm not privy to what goes on in the locker room, of course, 
but you know that I would say that um I I personally feel that tomorrow's game is going to be a tougher game for the Saints to pull out than the Pats game but you know every every Sunday is a little bit different I mean it's been what <clears throat> to uh, how long has it been since uh Drew's retired too three years now I thought it was before the pandemic wasn't it I was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I yeah, the pandemic. It's like we all just kind of <laughs> wiped that out from our memories, and yeah. you know, it's like, you know, anything prior to twenty twenty or twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty two is kind of like, yeah, ah, we'll just erase that from history. You know, yeah. um, that's a good point. So yeah, <laughs> I guess uh, I was I was going to say that maybe that since uh, he's been gone, they've been looking for some sort of leadership on the field. But um, it sounds like it's been a long struggle if that's been the case. Uh, yeah uh, yeah i guess i better brush i need to brush up on the saint stuff now yeah well i mean if you ever want to take part in the conversation because otherwise i'm just talking to the monitor and i'll get <laughs> i'll get the occasional comment about you know that you know people will chime in and um of course uh again oh you know what i i would be remiss if i didn't mention that um we for the people local to the seattle area we do meet at the pump house for uh every 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 saints game and um they've got an awesome food menu they've got a full bar they've got craft beer um and they're super nice and they set aside an area for us to watch and we're slowly growing that group but one of the things that i'm also starting to do is kind of what we've got going on right now except i'm taking the show on the road so um, even if you are in the Seattle area or you're from anywhere really, and you want to participate, commiserate, celebrate, um, we'll have a channel, we'll have an outlet <laughs> to do that because, uh, I think it, it's, th there's a, there's a very large, uh, saints ex patriot community. And if you listen to any of the other podcasts that are out there, there are people calling from around the world. I was just listening to a podcast just the other day. A guy from Australia follows the Saints. Uh, all right, cool. Well, thanks. I'm going to do my quick editorial, and we'll wrap the show right. here. Um, I wanted to tell you the tale of the $200 pumpkin. Now, whoever came up with the idea of going to the pumpkin patch during the start of fall was one sadistic son of a, a bleep. And, uh, yeah, I remember pumpkin patch and it's like, okay, cool. Yeah, I do that one time. And then after that, it's like, oh, I know we can pay $25 a person to go out in the rain and mud, which we may get the stroller stuck in, select a gourd from some field in the middle of nowhere, freeze our butts off, get lost in a maze of corn and somehow make it better by sipping on some cheap hot apple cider. I can maybe do a little shopping for the house decorations and make it more festive. It'll be fun. And that's how a $12 pumpkin becomes a $200 pumpkin. Uh, you guys take care of yourself, and I will see you next weekend. we got some cool stuff coming. And look for more announcements on that later in the week. All right. Take care, everybody.